I'm looking carefully at my watch. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how delightful it is to see all of you gathered here um, tonight with us to celebrate um, the work of this land trust. I feel like it's been a long haul and uh, since 2020. Um, that's shaped all of our lives in some really interesting ways. And uh, both in terms of how we've spent time indoors um, and outdoors. But I wanted to say that even though COVID has really reshaped our lives for each of us, and it, but the one through line for me has been the astounding work of the volunteers of this land trust, which has enabled us to keep those 20 preserves and trails open during a time where an enormous number of people wrote or called us and said the ability to get outdoors during this pandemic has kept them focused and sane. So that's a good thing. Um, and I think that is actually leaves us for much to celebrate. Those trails are open and those public affairs, public gatherings that many of you attended are only done because of the consequence of the work that's done by all of you. Our staff is hardworking and dedicated, but they couldn't have pulled off what we've pulled off without the astounding efforts on it of the network of volunteers. When you look at those trails, know that over 160 people and it are spending time making that possible, hauling those chainsaws, bringing in those tools, chopping up those trees and opening those trails up. When I look at the array of stuff um, that all of you have done from collating, from writing articles to writing grants, and I'm looking at you, and uh, to helping us raise money in all the varying ways we've been able to do it. It's an astounding rate of accomplishment. And I just wanna say thank you. I also want to say, if you haven't looked at our new website yet, you should, for two reasons. First off, it's got astounding depth of material on it, really beautiful photographs, and you can do a little editing. If you notice, you know, it's only two weeks old. So Amelia says, if you notice anything a little quirky, <laughs> shoot her an email um, and let her know, but do take a look. And uh, finally, you know, many of you have met her, many of you have known and worked with her, and, uh, but I would like to introduce Julia. And McLeod. She's a native Mainer, which is a wonderful thing for a land trust, a graduate of the College of the Atlantic and Bar Harbor. She's worked, of course, for years as our outreach coordinator and then as our outreach director. And then, of course, Annette Reed said it's time and is now acting executive director. I know myself that Reed did this great big breath of satisfaction and relaxation. Look at that man grin. <laughs> <laughs> feeling that he was in a wonderful position to be able to walk on out and focus in it as a part-time land stewardship coordinator. This is an unusual arrangement that's worked magnificently well for us, um, partly because it's let Reed, as he said, do what he loves the most, um, which is really concentrate um, working with one of our board members, Lynn, to cumble together everything that's in his head down on paper in terms of what forward-thinking land acquisition might look like. All of us who've been reading the papers or seeing the house for sale signs up um, are fully aware and uh, that significant plots of land in Harpswell are getting smaller and smaller, um, very few big ones left. And, uh, and so the very important work that they're doing now and it is to begin to look at what makes strategic sense. Where can lands be hooked up together? Where are there quarters that would be better for habitat? Um, the results of that, um, the board will be meeting to look over sometime this fall, um, and we're very excited. But with no further ado, because there's a lot to say, Julia. Hi there. Um, I'm excited to see you all. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be together again, and there's so many of you who I've worked with as volunteers, or I've emailed with, or have met at events or all kinds of places. So it's, it's so nice to see you all tonight. Um, so welcome. I'm gonna give you a little bit of an update on what we've been up to at the Land Trust over the past year, but I wanted to start by introducing our staff. And so in the 10 years that I've been with this Land Trust, we've gone from just me and Reed to now having six year round staff, though uh, most of us are not full-time. Um, and then and some additional seasonal staff. So I just wanna introduce everyone so you can put a face to a name. Um, so we'll start with Amelia Graham over here. She's our development associate. Um, 
And then we'll start over here with Debbie Forrester. She's our newest staff member. She's our, she's our new programs assistant. So taking on some of the program coordination that I used to do in my outreach role. Um, I think you probably all know Reed, but Reed Coles is our lands and stewardship director. And next to Reed is Katie Neal. Um, and so Katie has been growing into a new role. She's now our office administrator. She took on some more hours, some more responsibilities. We've all been sort of shifting at responsibilities around a bit in the past six months. And we also have Lou Picone somewhere here, right? Oh yeah, so Lou Picone is, um, He is our seasonal Stover's Point Preserve Monitor. We have another Stover's Point Preserve Monitor, Shannon Lindsay, who I don't think is here tonight. And our stewardship coordinator, Priscilla Simer, would love to be here, but she has family visiting who she hasn't seen in a while. Did I forget anyone? I don't think so. Okay, so there's all the staff. And like I said, we've been sort of shifting things around, trying to figure out what works for us as a growing organization. So to tell you a little bit about what's been going on over the past year, um, so I'll start with the conservation work. So a lot of you may be aware of the Tondro project. We have this amazing opportunity to conserve 57 acres that's off Route 24 right across from Harpsville Community School. Um, the owners of it are five siblings who are really, really passionate about seeing their land conserved and so are offering it to us at a significant bargain from what they could sell it for. So it's really thanks to them that this conservation project is possible. It's gonna be an incredible place for a new trail. Once we acquire it, we'll put in a parking lot off Route 24 and put in a new loop trail. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of property. I can't wait for you guys to be able to see it. It has shoreline, protects the uh, water of Quahog Bay and has some nice woods. So that's really exciting. And um, we're, I'll tell you a little bit more, a little bit later about that fundraising project. Um, we're also working on the acquisition of two additional properties, which are both being offered to us as donations. And we are very grateful for those landowners who want to, are passionate about seeing their land conserved. And you'll hear more about those as they become more um, closer to completion. And we're working with four different landowners on conservation easements. So a conservation easement is an agreement that restricts the future uses of a piece of property. So it conserves it, makes sure it's not developed in the future, but it still retains, stays in private ownership. So the, the landowner still owns the property, but they've agreed to put some restrictions on future uses. So this is a good tool for us as a land trust and a good tool for the town of Harpswell because we can get more land conserved. Um, so we have four landowners working on that. So it's a good thing that Reed stepped into lands and stewardship director because he is keeping very busy with the land's work. We're always on the alert for other land, opportun land conservation opportunities. Um, and we're looking at how we can protect critical working waterfront for the fishing community as well. Um, and Wendy told you about the, the lands analysis project that's gonna set us up for the future, making priorities for where we wanna put our energy in our land conservation in the future. So the next part of what we do is stewardship. So stewardship, once we acquire it, then it goes over to stewardship and that's how we take care of it forever, for all of the future. So our stewardship work is heavily driven by volunteers. And so we have volunteer stewards for every one of our preserves and trails. And some of them are in this room and thank you, thank you, thank you. Cause they get out there and they cut blowdowns and they paint blazes and they build bog bridges. And so get so, so much work done um, like Wendy say, said, during COVID, we heard from a lot of people about how much they enjoyed our trails, and those trails are kept safe and pleasant in, in large part because of our stewards. So thank you for that. Um, we had a couple of new things. We had an Eagle Scout who headed up the construction of a new loop trail at the Little Ponds Preserve in Cundies Harbor. So if you haven't been down there recently, I would suggest giving it a try. The trail is a lot longer now, um, and it's a really nice new loop trail. We also had an intern who was helping us out with stewardship from Harpswell Coastal Academy. So it was really gratifying. I mean, he helped us get a lot of work done and it's also gratifying to help someone gain some experience in the field. So if Priscilla was here, I would say, thank you Priscilla for overseeing his work, but we can all tell her that when we see her again. 
Um, we also continue to work with the Harpswell Invasive Plant Partnership to work on controlling the invasive plants on our properties. And we also continue to monitor our conservation easements. So it's, it's very important. We're taking on this forever commitment to monitor these easements. And so we have to take a look at them and make sure that all the um, restrictions are being upheld. And we're really lucky that we have wonderful easement owners who are, who are being really respectful of those easements. Um, the next part that I'd like to talk about is our outreach and education. And so if you've heard me talk at annual meetings in the past, this is where I usually have all these cute pictures of kids up on the screen. Sorry, we don't have pictures right now. There was some pictures in the slideshow before. Um, so what, Outreach and education is a lot of a lot of continuing things that we've been doing in the past. So continuing to work with every student at Harpswell Community School. Um, I went into the school for 80 visits to the to those classes. It's a K-5 school. So every student is seeing me um, multiple times through the school year. And we're going out in the woods and we're doing science, we're doing hands-on science, we're doing nature-based play. Um, those kids are getting a chance to connect with nature and to connect with Harpswell. So that's a part of um, a part of their schooling. And it's very satisfying to me and the teachers are happy about it and parents and the kids love it. <laughs> so, um, oh, and I should say that that is that work is thanks to the Holbrook Community Foundation. So thank you to Holbrook Community Foundation for funding that education work that we do. We also have our nature day camp program. So we have 10 sessions of nature day camp this summer for about 170 kids getting out and poking around in the tide pools and playing in the woods and catching butterflies and generally having fun outside in Maine, which is a good thing to be doing in the summer. Um, we have all our public programming. So it's been really nice to go back to in-person programming. We did a bunch of webinars during COVID, um, but it's nice to have a uh, full series of nature walks this summer. We have some coming up that you can still sign up for. We have a tide pool exploration. We have a talk on boat building, the history of boat building. We have an oyster tour by kayak. We have a ge geology walk and we are offering our sunset cruise again this summer, well, in September this year. So we still have things. You can check out that new website and see what we have coming up for programs. Um, this week is also the week for our This Week in Harpswell photo project. We're collecting photos from every season. Um, we choose one week in every season and we encourage you all to send us your pictures taken in Harpswell. So we've collected some really remarkable photos over time. And I encourage you to check out those albums on our website. We have some note cards over there made from those photos. So it's really neat to have this snapshot in time um, one week out of each season. And that's this week. So you send in your photos. Um, and then the last thing about outreach, just to mention that we have an increasing amount of resources available, not just on our website, but we keep on sort of adding to our merchandise, which, and merchandise makes it sound, well, it's really educational resources. We have a pocket naturalist guide to the seashore life that we created last year. We have two of Ed's books, and you'll get to hear Ed speak later tonight. We have some exploration kits that are designed for kids to help um, engage kids with the outdoors. Um, it's kind of like camp in a bag. Um, and we have some note cards. Um, and uh, we have the Harpswell Invasive Plant Partnerships Guide over there too. So you can take a look at those things. The last thing I want to update you on is where we are on development and finances. So we are a very, um, we're in a strong, solid financial footing. And we, um, we continue to grow our membership. So membership in 2021 was 928 member families. So maybe we'll get to 1,000 this year. I don't know, but um, that continues to grow, which is great to see. And we are grateful for all of you um, for being members and supporting everything that we do. Um, we're also very grateful for our business and foundation and community sponsors. And we have a poster over there that thanks our business sponsors and all the, also the foundations that support our work. Um, and then I wanna share a little bit about the Forever Campaign. So this is kind of the first time telling the public we've been in this quiet phase of this campaign for several years. The Forever Campaign has three goals. We're trying to build up our endowment because we are in the forever business. We're taking on land and taking on easements that we're, dead, we're committing to protect forever. So we need to be sure that we'll be around to do that. 
And so we're building up our endowment. We're raising money for the Tondro acquisition, which I told you about, which is part of the Forever campaign. And then we're hoping to bolster our acquisition fund because uh, land acquisition is very much opportunistic. And some things, when things become on the market, you want to be ready to seize the opportunity. So we want to bolster that fund as well. So we are in the last push of this campaign. We would welcome you to get involved. We have some materials over on the table. We also have a special set of note cards specifically to raise money for the Forever campaign. They all have um, bird photos on them. They're also on the table over there. Um, oh, and I'll just mention too with the Tondro acquisition that we were, we were happy to receive a grant from the Land for Maine's Future Project program to um, help us acquire that property. So that really put us even a step closer to being to the end of that campaign. So I'll just end by just saying thank you because there's so many people who make this organization successful to all our board of trustees, many of whom are in the room, um, to our staff, to our community partners. We have a lot of good, strong relationships with a lot of community groups in Harpswell. And of course, our volunteers that help us be a vital, growing and successful organization. So thank you so much. And I will turn it back over to Wendy. We'll get into the presentation, people. Be patient. It's close. We're going to lose two people very close to our hearts um, at the end of this evening. As a matter of fact, two men who have served with us for years and ably helped us trust along the way. The first I want to mention is Dan Hoover, who's sitting right here in front of me. And uh, he's been a trustee for years, done three different terms, and is now terming off. He served on at least four committees by my research this morning, um, and as most recently as our treasurer. You all don't know that while he was serving on four committees and being treasurer, he took his engineering skills and went and designed the band gazebo thingy out at Mitchell Field. So who knew? And uh, I meant to... <laughs> And the other, I don't know if he's here tonight, but Bob Sansone is also in it, leaving the board tonight. He has co-chaired our Forever Fund. Um, and he and Lou Hinman have been absolutely critical in getting us as close as we've gotten to meeting our goals. We're really, really excited to be bringing this campaign home. It's gonna make a significant difference in our ability to meet our responsibilities. And I was thinking Bob too, and I know him as the public face in it of the campaign, but he's also a retired lifelong, um, very experienced human resource um, person. And, Ed, and so what folks don't realize is like Don and his engineering skills and uh, his human resource skills have meant that we've had a professional level of expertise made available to us that have been really difficult to afford. And so right now, Julia has been meeting with Bob and they're going over our entire HR handbook and bringing us into the modern age. Um, it's those kinds of volunteer efforts and the enormous skill set that's available in this community that lets us pull off as much as we do. Um, and I think both of these men exemplify um, that spirit, that ethos, and a, a, that really makes this town thrive. But we didn't forget them. We just did. Now, this kid, we did coffee in the morning. By two in the afternoon, they remember us. Yeah. The other thing, of course, is you have both of your phone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't run and you can't hide. Finally, I think it's, um, I don't know what to say. Read. I don't know what we would have done without you. When it comes right down to it, and that Reed has helped build this land trust um, for more years than most of us can account. And it, he stepped down formally as executive director in February. He's retiring at the end of the year. Um, but he has seen accompanied this land trust along every step of the way um, to become what we are today. Um, there's no way to even say thank you. Um, so I won't even try. Instead, I'm going to introduce our rep state representative, Jay McCray. Would you come up, please? District 51, Harpsville, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So one of the privileges of being a, a legislator is having the opportunity to, um, to put in for a sentiment. And it's also a chance to embarrass people like Reed. 
So legislative sentiment goes into the public record and is there forever. And it's reserved for special ac accomplishments. You can put in a request for all sorts of things, but they don't all get approved. This one was, there was no doubt. Um, this comes from the legislature and from me and from our Senator, Maddie Daughtry. Maddie wasn't able to be here tonight because she is um, on her job as um, you may know, she owns Moderation Brewery. So she says, I know I speak for many of us when I say I'm deeply grateful for Reed and all of HHLT's work to conserve and create such a bounty of outdoor opportunities. Reed, thank you for everything you've done for our community and thank you for your leadership. Now, this is the official legislative sentiment, which is suitable for framing. And this one is for Reed and um, I gave Julia one for the land trust. So I'd like to read it to you. We be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives join in recognizing the Honorable James Reed Coles of Harpswell on his retirement as executive director of the Harpswell Heritage Land Trust after 16 years of service and 10 years of earlier service as a member of the main House of Representatives, focusing as a legislator on protecting our natural resources and environment and supporting our many marine related resources, Mr. Coles continued this work as executive director, also overseeing the trust move to a permanent office location and more than doubling the lands owned by the trust, as well as successfully achieving accreditation by the Nas National Land Trust Alliance, demonstrating that the trust meets the highest nat national standards for excellence and conservation permanence. We extend our congratulations and best wishes and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 130th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. And it's signed The sentiment is signed by the president of the Senate, the speaker of the house, the secretary of the Senate, the clerk of the house, and we didn't get to sign, but Maddie and I are on there. <laughs> and Reed as a former legislator got to do this as well. So it was an honor. <laughs> I also want to thank my longtime colleague, Julie McLeod, for taking over the job as executive director. It's been such a great job. Uh, I'm really confident that I'm leading the trust in pretty good hands today. And uh, I look forward to uh, hopeful success and many more successes. Okay, folks, this is not just a party. We got business we have to attend to. And at tonight, and at, we have, this is the opportunity at the annual membership to approve the slate of candidates brought, by, um, brought forward by our nominating committee. I wanna thank Becky Galley, who's in here somewhere, who ably chaired the committee and brought forth the following names. We have three trustees and at, who've been signed up for another term, which is really, really wonderful. That'd be Doug Warren, and at, who couldn't come here tonight because his house cast got COVID. Um, a warning to you all. And at, um, to Steve Caulfield, who's here up, there he is right there. Um, and to Christine, who's sitting over here, Betcher. We're delighted that all three of them have been willing um, to serve another term pending all of your approval. We also have two new members um, proposed to you tonight, that is Rachel Bean. Rachel, will you stand up? And Don Westfall. Don worked in Washington, D.C. as an economic analyst on food and agriculture for a number of years. He also served here, in, um, as I believe, as an advisor to the Department um, of Agriculture here in Maine as well. 
good to have a local guy come back um, and help us out. And Rachel, I actually have to read this, geologist, that part's easy, but she holds the endowed chair of the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Natural Sciences in the Department of Earth and Oceanographic Science at Bowdoin. <laughs> and uh, we are very delighted um, that you can join us. And uh, so, and, it, and then finally, we have a slate of officers proposed once again. And it, we are, the nominating committee is renominated Wendy Batson, that'd be me um, as president, and Tim McCray. Tim, where are you? Up, right there, um, as vice president. Um, we're also, Sharon Omig has very kindly agreed to step into the role of treasurer, replacing Dan, big shoes to fit. Uh, no follow. And, uh, um, and Ron Davies, our stewardship coordinator. Ron, there you are back there, um, is stepping in as secretary. So pending business of the day, could I have a motion to accept the slate of candidates for officers and trustees? Can I have a second? Evelyn approved? Raise your hand. Oh, I can't vote. And it's all opposed? Thank God, it's not like that wedding where somebody stands up and says something <laughs> dreadful. I am deeply relieved. And uh, this is really exciting because guess what? Ta-da, we've made it to Ed. And uh, all of you know, I think our author and naturalist, Ed Robinson, who's been writing and uh, about Harpswell for some years now. Oh. He was one of the nature editors, now available. And you're about to see some spectacularly wonderful photographs. Yeah, we'll come from. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I'm using the right. Can you find it? Can you find it? Yeah. Just saying. And, uh, and with no further ado, our program of the evening The Mystery of Maine's Wildlife. able to hear me as well. How's that for volume in the back? Since I wear hearing aids, I'm pretty well attuned to that issue. Not working yet? Probably warming up. Uh, Julie and I had a little trouble with the uh, projection here, but we'll manage. Okay, uh, thank you very much for allowing me the pleasure of coming here tonight. Um, I have to give thanks to some of the trustees of the land trust for pushing me into this uh, book and speaking project. Um, I don't know how many years ago it is now, but they insisted that I was going to do a book, uh, collecting some of the articles I'd written and putting some new material together. I said, I don't know anything about writing a book, let alone publishing a book, distributing a book, selling a book, etc. But uh, as the English say, must needs, you, you kind of figure it out as you go along. It's turned into a, a, a delight. I've learned a heck of a lot. I've met some wonderful people and the land trust has made quite a few thousand dollars off it so far. So uh, good project to keep going. And uh, I am working on a third book as we speak. Uh, so save your pennies. Uh, <laughs> we'll launch that next year probably. Um, during the pandemic, I didn't have the pleasure of live audiences and it's uh, possible to give Zoom presentations on material like this, but it's nowhere near as much fun. People feel inhibited about telling me their stories, asking me questions, whatever. So it's really great fun to be back with uh, you and, and audiences like you. So 
uh, this presentation is to promote the second book. I had an earlier presentation, which many of you have probably seen, called The Wonder of Maine's Wildlife, that uh, was a companion piece to book one. You're gonna see new creatures. So we're gonna talk about eight uh, species in particular. And uh, I hope you agree that they meet the definition of mysterious. Some of the wild things that are out and about uh, in our community and around our state are things that are, are visible, they're not hidden, but when we're busy driving up Route uh, uh, 24 or 123, we, we may not stop and look at things. We may not think about some of these creatures. Um, you know, we've just gone through lupin season. Uh, I, I was looking at some mallards recently are starting the molting process as, as this guy did here. They don't look like mallards for a while. Um, and of course, we're not quite at the point where our larch trees will begin to change, but uh, soon enough. There are other creatures that we'll see occasionally. And uh, if we are, are lucky enough or smart enough to take a minute to, uh, to see them, they bring us a bit of joy. I, I love watching these guys fly around the waterfront uh, and, and see them diving and coming up with fish. Uh, Cooper's hawks, you're probably not gonna see them very often, but when you do, I mean, they're really uh, beautiful birds. Uh, porcupines, depends on your attitude about porcupines. Uh, <laughs> if you're a dog owner, you're probably not too keen on seeing them up close because they, they can be a real pain. Uh, and this little beauty here, the common yellow throat. I, I wrote in book two about uh, my disgust with the name for this beautiful bird. Uh, forgive me to uh, the, the people who named it originally. And then there's creatures that we just don't see unless you spend a lot of time skulking around in the woods or this, the uh, marshes as I do. You know, you're not gonna see some of these creatures. The rough grouse uh, drumming on a log or, or a rock back in the woods. You may hear that sound. You might not recognize it for what it is, but these are gorgeous birds. Um, this, this lovely salmon here, landlocked salmon in the uh, par stage, the immature stage of just a, a couple of inches. Meadow voles. You probably see raptors chewing on them, but uh, unless you're digging around in the underbrush, you probably don't see too many of them. And then the bobcat, uh, beautiful cats. And uh, it's, to me, fun to know that they exist even in our community. But I'm gonna focus on eight creatures, as I said, and I wanted to start with the Atlantic puffin. They are photogenic as heck, and they're certainly one of the most popular creatures in Maine, therefore using them on the cover of my book. Um, I had the great good fortune to go to the only island in the United States where you can see these birds and get up close and comfortable with my camera. They used to nest on a number of islands in Maine. These days, it's only six. And really, it's only one island in, in any kind of numbers. But they are making a comeback. As long as we have enough fish in the water for them, they'll continue to improve. Like the loon, these are awkward birds on the water. And you'll see those little stubby wings. They, you know, they're, they're chubby little guys, even though they only stand about eight inches tall, it's hard for them to get aloft. So they actually run on the water until they get enough head of steam up to take off. Uh, somebody pointed out that this little guy has a band on his leg. Uh, that's a, an active uh, science project to find out where these guys go. Where do they go? All over the place. Uh, after the breeding season, uh, somewhere around mid-August, they leave these islands. And in the winter, you can find them in the Mediterranean, you can find them in the Southern uh, Atlantic. They don't cross into the Pacific, but uh, they cover a heck of a lot of ground and, and basically live on the, the ocean all uh, winter long. This is the island, Machias Seal Island. Uh, you go on a, on a boat out of uh, Cutler, Maine, there's just one boat in the United States that has the license to take people out to the island. Like Jenny Island here in Harpswell, most uh, bird breeding islands are off limits from mid-March to uh, the end of August. 
But in this case, they do allow uh, amateurs like uh, us to land on the island, 15 people a day. And you have to be lucky with the tide and the wind and the waves to get out of the boat onto the island. Even from the boat, you're gonna see hundreds and hundreds of birds of, of all sorts. But of course, we're interested in the puffins. What they do is they, they take you up this seaweed laden causeway and uh, try to keep your footing, march you across a boardwalk and stuff you in this little outhouse like building that has uh, four little drop uh, windows on it on all sides. It, it, there's enough room in there to put four friendly people <laughs> and you spend uh, two hours in there they're not allowed to walk around on the island. Uh, they don't want to encourage human bird interaction. But the exciting thing is that these birds are right there, including on the roof, pitter pattering back and forth right over your head. It's, it's really funny. And when we got in the uh, blind, here is this gorgeous Northern Gannet. Uh, it was the only one on the island uh, that day that we knew of and, and he was right in front of me. I got some great pictures. A lot of these razor bills. My son says they look like ninja warriors. And just one puffin here. And I thought, oh my goodness, where are the puffins? Well, we didn't have to worry. They, uh, they began to filter in, fly in, buzz us. Uh, the birds travel at about 40 miles an hour and, and not counting a wind. So you gotta be pretty quick if you wanna see them, let alone take a photo. But the, the, the drive of course is to bring young puffins into this world. Uh, they will select a burrow or, or prepare one if, the, if they can find a, a little notch to work with, or they'll just go down among the big boulders that are all over the shoreline. And they'll put a few nesting materials, but not much, it's not really much of a nest. And then the female lays an egg, but what an egg. It's 20% of her body mass. Females just have a heck of a time in life, don't they? But one egg. So hopefully that egg hatches and they can bring the chick to uh, fruition. And they do the best to guard that egg uh, during the period of time they're on the island. It's only about a, a six, eight week period of time. But these birds are not aggressive. They're not really set up to defend themselves. Apparently they can give quite a bite if you stick your hand down in there. But uh, you know, if, uh, if a mink or a, a rat or a dog comes along, uh, that's bad news. That's why they use offshore islands. They have to uh, keep their strength up, of course. And once the, the babies are born, they have to go out and get food for the baby. Uh, as I said before, flying is a bit of a challenge for them. And if the wind is really strong, it knocks them around, but they somehow manage to get aloft and then they zip off. Uh, ideally, they're gonna fish close to shore, a few miles at most. But when the fishing is tough, they're known to go as far as 30, 50, even a hundred miles. The problem is, of course, that takes a huge amount of energy and a lot of time away from the egg the parents take turns doing that. But if they've burned all their energy to go out and find food, they don't have a lot to, uh, to take care of the uh, chick uh, when they get back. They're magnificent divers. These birds have been clocked uh, down to 600 feet. Imagine that. And uh, they can stay down for minutes at a time collecting food as they go. The ideal fish for them is somewhere, you know, like a four inch minnow. And uh, they don't tend to swallow it while they're swimming. They just hang on to it and come back with these uh, iconic pictures you see with their mouth stuffed full of food. Um, but uh, it, it's pretty impressive to think what they're capable of in the water. They're like rockets. And of course, they're a photographer's dream. Uh, I took over 2,500 pictures uh, <laughs> that day. <laughs> the, old, the old camera was going light speed and uh, it was just amazing. Uh, I had razor bills breeding on a rock about six feet away, puffins standing on one leg looking at us, uh, you know, communicating with each other. It was really something.
you could do a lot worse than filming uh, puffins in your spare time, believe me. Okay, so the next creature we're gonna talk about is the black bear. How many have seen a black bear? Pretty good number. How many of those were on the highway? Okay, in the woods, uh, how many of you seen them in the woods? Okay, well, that's good. Most people uh, haven't had that good fortune. You must be outdoors oriented. Uh, Maine has a growing population, growing quickly uh, and outnumbering the harvest uh, during hunting season. So it raises some interesting issues, but we have over 30,000 bears in the state right now. Come on here. <laughs> Don't tell me this is gonna fail. Julia, I may need to have you help me here. Okay. Okay. Uh, black bears uh, are very adept at climbing. Oops. Very adept at climbing. And mom will often put her cubs up a tree for safety. A friend of mine was out in Alberta years ago, and uh, the uh, place where he was had stands set up out in the woods where you could go observe wildlife. And he took his video with him uh, one afternoon, wanted to see if he could get some pictures of bears. Well, he got some photographs. Uh, two cubs came in and started rolling around on the ground, tussling as you'd expect. They went up his tree. With all the trees in the forest, they had to pick his tree. And he thought, well, this is fun. You know, I'll get some photographs uh, or some video. But of course, mom came along. She was none too happy when she saw and smelled him in the tree with her cubs. She started climbing up the ladder to where he was positioned. He had no weapon. It was nothing he could do. He could hardly hit her over the head with his video camera. But he had the presence of mind not to scream and try to jump out of the tree. He spoke to her quietly, calmly, uh, even though he must have been a little jittery uh, inside. She put her paws up on the platform where he was and stuck her nose up. And he had the presence of mind to just put his foot on her nose and press down, still speaking to her. She got a good whiff of him at that point and decided she didn't like what she smelled gave a really loud whoof, and the cubs went flying down the tree. She went flying into the woods, and he had a, a moment of uh, significant relief. <laughs> Is this gonna work now? No, you'll have to do it, Julia, I'm sorry. So uh, bears, very opportunistic omnivores. They will eat just about anything. And in the spring, when they first come out of hibernation, they've lost 35, 40% of their body mass uh, during all those weeks and months uh, with no food. They eat grass to get their digestive system started to clean it out and so on. But as soon as they can, they begin looking for carry-on like we have in the left here. Um, that still worked okay. And uh, they are notorious predators of fawns. Uh, black bears and deer fawns in this area out west. Grizzlies in some areas will take 95% of the elk calves that are born in a year. So an imbalance of the population can really cause trouble. Uh, they love food if you put it on offer. And uh, the advice of course is to take your feeders uh, down in early March if you're in bear country. Later they'll eat berries. They love honey and they don't mind eating bees. Uh, they're fur is thick enough that the, the bees can't really drive a bear away. And if you keep your grill looking like this, they'll probably knock it over and lick that clean. Uh, high nutrient foods. You've probably seen logs in the woods like this that have been ripped to shreds. Other creatures will do that too, a skunk or a raccoon. But if you see a big log really torn apart, that, that's almost certainly a bear. And what they're looking for are guys like this. A lot of fat there and a lot of en energy. Uh, ants, they will uh, snack on ants uh, as long as they can get them. They really love moths. And you say, moths? Well, moths have about a calorie per moth of energy. 
And on a good day, certain areas where moths are, are hatching, they'll eat up to 40,000 moths in a day. <laughs> I think I'd want some water if I had to eat that <laughs> diet. <laughs> but, uh, that's, that's a very well-known phenomenon. Go ahead. Most people encounter bears uh, by chance. And uh, those uh, situations normally work out okay. 99% of the time that bear is gone before you even know it's there because they don't want to be around humans. Their noses are exceptionally good. Their hearing is exceptionally good. Their eyesight, not so good. But you know, if, if you're making noise, talking, your, your pack is jangling, whatever, they're, they're gonna be gone. But bend over and pick blueberries in the right patch and you could find you've got company there. That happened to me when I was about 12 years old, picking uh, blueberries with my family in New York. And we backed out of the patch pretty quickly. Next slide. Okay, I thought I would share some information on, on bear identification. This is a very imprecise process, but I thought you might find it of interest. This is almost certainly a young bear, not necessarily a juvenile, you know, a second year bear, but you'll notice the long, narrow snout, and the face is not very wide. The ears are quite prominent. This is not a big, heavy, mature bear. Let's go to the next one. This is probably a mature sow. I can't say that with 100% uh, precision, but when I contrast it with the boar here in a bit, you, you, maybe you'll see what I'm talking about. Her face is a little bit broader, a little heavier, but still the nose uh, is fairly prominent here. Let's look at the next picture. This is almost certainly a large male or, or the boar as he's called. You'll notice how the face has flattened out. This is particularly true with grizzly bears and, and brown bears. And the, the nose kind of uh, loses some of its prominence. The ears now are, are not very uh, prominent in this case. A bear like that in Maine can weigh 600, 700 pounds. Down in North Carolina, they take bruisers well over 900 pounds some years. I mean, that's bigger than a lot of grizzlies. Hibernation is generally done in a cave if they can find one, but they're quite happy to dig uh, a, a den under tree roots. So you get these uh, root balls forming. And the cubs are born alive in the middle of winter, January, February period of time. Uh, the mother will rouse enough to get them onto the, the nipple and they will feed uh, during the rest of that period of confinement. I thought you might find it interesting to see uh, uh, different colors of bears. In, in a place like Maine, 99.9% .9 of our bears are black varying shades of black. They may have white on the throat or a patch on the head, but they're black. Uh, the biologist for the state said about one out of 5,000 bears in Maine would be cinnamon colored, like that young one we saw early. To go out west, it's a different story. You might have as many as 50% what they call color phase bears. Uh, this is a, more of a, an orangish cinnamon than that other one we saw. This is the Kermode bear, there's very, very few of those, only a couple hundred of these. The natives refer to them as ghost bears up in the uh, 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 Northwest Territories and Alaskan area. There's also a bear called the Glacier bear, which is a stainless steel uh, blue color. I couldn't find a good photograph to show that, but uh, just lovely creature. They're all black bears. Those are just genetic differences. When you see a couple of brutes like this going at it, you probably want to back out of there and move on. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to talk about one of the more exotic creatures in Maine. How many have seen one of these? Okay, two or three of you. Um, I've had the good fortune to see two of them here in Maine and, and one in Alaska that I wrote about in the book, Spectacular Cats. Uh, notice the size of the feet before we go any further. They're like snowshoes, which are, are critical to them in the winter, of course, when they're trying to, to hunt. Uh, this is, of course, the Canada lynx, not Canadian, but Canada. Next slide. 
Uh, numbers are improving. Uh, they have restricted trapping and, and hunting of lynx. And there's a very rigorous program to tag them, track them, study these cats. The good news is that the population has grown to the point where they now have, have camera evidence that they're moving into northern New Hampshire. They've seen female with cubs uh, that they are almost certain went across the border from Maine. Um, the, the key thing here is their diet. They are dependent on the snowshoe hare. Can we have the next slide? I use this picture because most people, if they see a lynx, they've seen them crossing a road in the middle of winter. You're snowmobiling, you're hiking, you're skiing, whatever. Um, we saw a couple when we were fly fishing up in the area north of Rangeley, way up on the McGalloway River. Both of those, interestingly, had uh, collars on. Uh, beautiful cats. The problem with them is that they're susceptible to predation by uh, coyotes. Coyotes hunt in packs. These are loners. And if a coyote decides he wants to go after a cat and has some help, the, the, the lynx may be in trouble. Next slide. One of the things that's interesting is the similarity between these two cats. Uh, so I thought I would point out a few things. You, it's hard to tell the size here. A bobcat, 20, 25 pounds at max, where the lynx could go 35, 40. There have been bigger ones, but that, that's kind of the range you're talking about. You notice the feet. The bobcat has big feet, but not as big as the lynx. You'll see the tuft on the ears. The bobcat's ear tuft is just hair, maybe half an inch, where the lynx looks like uh, somebody that hasn't shaved his ears in a while, guys. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Uh, You'll notice the whiskers, the, the, the mutton chops that the bobcat develops in the winter. The, the uh, lynx is not so likely to, to, to get that big fuzzy hair. Uh, spots, more on a bobcat, fewer on a lynx. They tend to be a tawny uh, color. One of the definitive things is this, the white bottom to the tail where the lynx has a black tail. Now, when it's moving quickly through the woods, Good luck spotting that and, and making definitive ID, but at least you'll know the difference. Uh, 80% of their diet is right there, it's snowshoe hare. Uh, the hare has a cyclical population. Every 78 years, they rise and fall. Not surprisingly, the population of the lynx will rise and fall. Uh, these guys are cyclical as well, the rough grouse. Turkeys, not so much. But you can imagine a lynx would be quite happy to get a, a 10 or 20 pound uh, turkey if he can get one. Uh, the lynx is big enough and strong enough to take a full size deer like that. They're even big enough to take a small elk if, uh, if they choose to. And of course, smaller mammals like this if they're hungry. Beautiful uh, kittens at, at this stage, of course. Uh, I've never seen them. I, I, I hope in my lifetime I'm lucky enough to do so, but uh, you'd have to be pretty close to where mom is and she's not going to be happy <laughs> to see me there. So this is a mother with her juveniles. The uh, juveniles tend to stay with mom through the first winter. And then in the spring when it's breeding season, you know, she'll shoo them away and they have to go off and find their own territory. But you can see it, it's difficult to judge who's mom and who's not uh, in this picture. And already their ear tufts have developed pretty substantially. Okay, next creature. This is a, definitely a creature of mystery. Now, if Priscilla was here tonight, she'd tell you about those that she gets at her bird feeder all the time. I don't know how she manages to do this, but uh, she has a couple that she sees pretty regularly. Uh, I've seen these guys in, in bird boxes. Uh, we'll see that in a bit more. You may hear them chittering up in a tree. I even had one run down a tree when I was running a chainsaw through a, a branch of a maple tree that I was uh, pruning. To my utter shock, he jumped over the saw blade uh, while I was in the midst of doing that. But normally you just don't see them. They're very shy, retiring, and they're mostly nocturnal. Go ahead. There are two 
uh, different species in North America. This is the Northern, this is the Southern. We actually have both now in the state. As the climate has warmed, these guys have moved further North and in Southern parts of the state, you can find them where in the North they'll be these. These guys are darker, particularly the hair here, and they're about two inches longer. These guys might be, uh, excuse me, seven, eight, nine inches, where this is gonna be more like five, six, uh, seven inches long. So. I love this photograph. I don't know who took it, how they took it. It's just amazing shot. But the reason I brought it in here is this. You can see that flap of skin that allows them to form a paraglider. My wife and I actually watched a paraglider set up shop and take off in the Alps last week uh, to our delight. Uh, but this guy uh, doesn't fly, of course, he glides. And uh, if he's got a little wind, he can go a little further, a little higher. The uh, stated range is about 300 feet. They'll go up 100 feet in a tree, for instance, 60, 70 feet, and, and then jump and, and uh, glide to another tree somewhere or, or land on the ground. I had one land on the ground next to me once when I was eating my lunch, and I just about fainted. <laughs> I think he was probably more surprised. Uh, they can actually carve a turn, which is kind of interesting. If they tip like this, you know, they're catching the wind on one side and slipping wind on the other, so they can actually uh, carve an arc out there. But it's a beautiful thing to watch. I know Julia has seen them in bird boxes as I had, but they're, they're cavity dwellers like squirrels and chipmunks. So they don't dig holes by themselves. Uh, these guys make a lot of holes in trees uh, that creatures like the uh, 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 squirrels will use. Next slide. If you put up nest boxes of certain size in the right position, you'll find them in there. I, I've had as many as four in a nest box that I opened looking for the remains of a street owl nest. Uh, I put them back in there and left them through the rest of the winter. They will also get in your house if you leave the crack. They may be better than bats as occupants in your attic, but I wouldn't recommend leaving them in there because you may soon have several uh, squirrels and their droppings and the noise they make at night, shuffling around and so on. We had one invade a cabin once in the middle of the night. That was kind of exciting. Okay, one of the smallest and most secretive owls. Anybody here seen a saw wet owl? One, two, three, four, five, good, okay. I was lucky enough to see one early one morning covered with snow. I didn't even know what it was at first. The, the, the snow was just coming down, uh, huge amounts of it in a, an early blizzard. But uh, then the head turned like this, and I realized that that was a, an owl. These guys, go ahead, Julia. These guys are tiny, seven inches tall, but a 20 inch wingspan, much bigger in relative terms than that little puffin that we would look at. And these, these guys can fly beautifully, maneuver through the woods. Um, and they're, they're really substantially capable hunters uh, despite their diminutive size. Next uh, slide. This is what you might see, one that has chosen to, to stay in a semi-visible spot during the day. They don't go way up in a tree, so you might be lucky enough someday walking through the woods to, to spot one. You just have to keep your eyes open. They, they call mostly at night. That calling sounds like uh, somebody blowing a whistle. And uh, it runs from early to mid-March, depending where you are, well into the summer. And it can be incessant. So if one sets up shop outside your window, you may not be too happy with him. <laughs> He's just looking for love like the rest of us. <laughs> We all, we all think of owls as having the most incredible flexibility uh, to their necks, and they do. I can't turn my neck 270 degrees, at least not at my age. Um, the reason for this is that they have eyes that are completely different from ours. Ours are kind of an elliptical uh, ball-shaped uh, organ. Theirs are a cylindrical tube that go back into their head, and they can't move them. So if they want to see something over here, they have to turn their head 
to do that. The reason for that uh, eye is that it gives them incredible binocular vision. They can judge distance down to the fraction of a millimeter in a way that we cannot do it. And the, those long tubes are also very good at capturing light so they can hunt at night. Their, their hearing is so good that they can hunt when they're blind or, or if you put a blindfold on them. How do they do that? Well, most owls have one, eye, one ear, excuse me, higher than the other. And that slight offset allows them to hear sound coming back at two slightly different uh, time periods. And they can triangulate from that where the, uh, where the target of interest is. Uh, they're very skilled. Uh, they would start hunting late in the day, maybe at this time of day. Um, and you know anything that's moving that they think they can handle, including snakes and amphibians and things that are, that are not on this uh, slide here. But uh, you know they're they're pretty capable at, at feeding themselves and their babies. Go ahead. I thought you'd like this picture of two of the babies. <laughs> Very fetching little creatures. The uh, Natural uh, History Observatory project in Maine, uh, located out in uh, the Cutler area, I think, I'm not exactly sure what community they're in. They actually have a citizen science project that you can sign up for if you're interested to monitor nest boxes for these guys. They'll teach you how to do it. They'll give you recordings, uh, paperwork, and so on. It would be a lot of fun to be tracking around trying to find these guys. Okay, next creature is the mink, the American mink to be specific. This is a, a creature in Europe, they call a stoat, but it, it's actually the, a, a very, very close cousin to the mink. These are marvelous creatures. Uh, there's a few of you in the audience that are old enough to remember when wearing one of these was the height of fashion. Go ahead, Julia. I used to run a trap line when I was a boy to earn some spending money. And anytime I caught a mink, my mother was just thrilled to feel that lush uh, fur with the deep, dark uh, under fur in the winter. Lots of different colors in nature. And of course, uh, I was lucky enough to live near a mink farm and had the mixed pleasure of working on that farm where they had all kinds of colors because of the selective breeding they were doing. Nowadays, of course, no one in this room is likely to be caught dead wearing mink, uh, at least in public. How many of you still have your coats hanging in the closet? <laughs> yeah. My wife still has her fur coats from her mother. I don't know why, but we pay storage on those every year. <laughs> I was very lucky out west uh, last September to come upon this uh, mink almost certainly a female. It's kind of hard to tell at a distance, but from her actions, I, I was almost certain she was. It was a cottonwood tree that had fallen at an angle into the river and her den therefore became angled rather than uh, uh, elevated to where she couldn't get at it. But she was acting very strange, uh, clearly disturbed. And it wasn't at me. She really wasn't paying any attention to me, even though I was on the bank closer than the, the table here with my camera clicking away. And I soon found out what was going on. Next slide. She was on high alert. Next slide. And this is why. This is almost certainly a male. And he was very interested in her and was trying to move in on her. The, at this point, they were probably five, six feet apart. And uh, he was slinking in as men do when they're not quite sure of themselves. <laughs> and she was growling and snapping and making it quite clear that his amorous intentions were not welcome. He finally gave up and uh, <laughs> moved off, but it was quite an encounter to see uh, this going on. I got these great pictures. They are adaptive predators, very capable uh, hunters. Um, one day I was fishing on the Kennebago River, having no luck as often happens, at least the way I fish. And uh, I sat down mid-morning to have a 
uh, half a sandwich and licked my wounds. And I noticed on the bank, on the other, or excuse me, the far bank, here along comes a mink, in and out of the water, up and down the rocks. All of a sudden, she comes up with a 12-inch brook trout. <laughs> her seats to eat it right in front of me. <laughs> okay, you know, you're better than I am. I didn't even tell me what fly she was using. Right? Uh, but they, uh, you know, they, they're very capable swimmers, like a river otter, and, and they can catch fish uh, very easily in a stream. They spend most of their lives in or near the water. And uh, this is a blackbird uh, that, that this one managed to take. Uh, amphibians, you know, things like frogs uh, are uh, at great risk of mink. Next slide. They uh, will move their babies if there's a threat. Normally the, the uh, den for uh, uh, the breeding season is in a big tangled root ball, uh, maybe a, a, a standard hole if there's one near the, the river. But if she sees a threat, she'll move the, uh, the cubs to, or kits, excuse me, to another location. It looks a little uncomfortable for the kit, but uh, <laughs> she's doing her best to save its life. Okay, how many of you have seen one of these human creatures? We got a lot of gardeners in here. Okay, they're really uh, amazing creatures. And this is an example of adaptation, evolution, whatever you wanna call it. I was out in a field uh, at my old farm in New York with the camera one afternoon in August, taking pictures of all the pollinators in my field. And I took picture after picture after picture, just rolling them off as fast as I could. Then I went back to the cabin, started looking through the photos, and I had this picture of something I thought was a hummingbird. I said, well, you know, what is a hummingbird doing on this particular plant? I think it was a thistle. I looked more closely at it and realized it was definitely not a hummingbird. It's a moth. Well, let's go to the next slide. There's a, a, there's a collection of four species of these things that have evolved to look and act just like hummingbirds, even though they are insects. And uh, there's actually quite an effort to try to document them. And there's a website where you can report sightings of them. So what I've done is collect pictures of the four. This is the one I saw, the hummingbird clearwing moth. The reason for that name clearwing is right here. The wing is actually made of keratin, the same material as our hair. And this, the colors here are scales. They're not feathers like they would be on a hummingbird, they're scales. And if for some reason those scales have been knocked off, you know, the moth is getting long in the tooth or has had an injury or something, then you can see through the, uh, the wing. Go ahead. Um, What's interesting about these, you know, the hummingbirds don't have this uh, antenna here, and they don't have this very long proboscis that the moth unrolls and, and sticks into a flower to grab nectar. In the meantime, collecting pollen that they spread around. So, you know, they're in the pollinator family, but uh, they can zip and fly, start, stop, almost as fast and almost as accurately as a hummingbird. If you ever get the chance to watch one of these, really spectacular. Go ahead. This is the one that I'd like to see. Uh, this is called the white lined sphinx moth. Very dramatic coloration on this one. And they're sizable. I mean, they're, they're four or five inches long, about the size of a hummingbird. So it's easy to get confused. I couldn't find a better photo of this one, the Nessus Sphinx Moth. I apologize that that's not high quality, but you get the ant for free in this <laughs> picture. Okay. Now this is an example of the larva stage of the moth to prove it's not a hummingbird, I guess. And oddly enough, it's called a hornworm. You don't have to worry, that thing is not sharp and it's not even all that uh, rigid, but it would scare some predators away, I guess. So last of, of the eight that I've chosen to profile, 
And that's the mountain lion or the cougar. Now, some of you are sitting there saying, Ed, you've lost it. We don't have mountain lions in Maine. Historically, we did not. We had the Eastern wolf, which were exterminated about 100 years, 120 years ago. Who took the place of the Eastern wolf in Maine? Coyotes. How many people hear them in Harpswell or see them in Harpswell? Uh, they're very well established in Maine these days. It took decades for them to move from their original home in the desert southwest. But nowadays, coyotes are everywhere, even as far north as Alaska in extreme cases. But what's interesting is that another predator, super predator, has also moved into the void left by the uh, absence of the wolf. Uh, they are well established in Ontario and into Quebec, and they have been found and documented scientifically as close as Connecticut. Uh, there were, for years, there were reports of a mountain lion in the west central part of Connecticut, and the fish and game people said that no, 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 we don't have any uh, mountain lions in Connecticut until one day there was a dead mountain lion on the side of the highway. And uh, they said, well, okay, it was a released cat from a zoo. But when they did DNA studies, they found out that this cat had left scat, I'm using the polite word, uh, on its journey from Colorado through Wisconsin and Michigan all the way to Connecticut, over 2,000 miles. I have seen pictures of mountain lions walking in a field. There's actually video online if you want to see it just two miles over the border into New Brunswick. Definitely a mountain lion from the tail. Uh, there are uh, online pictures from trail cameras in Fairfield, uh, Maine, of mountain lions walking through some guy's backyard. They're definitely here, at least visiting here. Whether they're established here and whether they're breeding here is, of course, to be determined. And it's not so easy to get a picture of a mountain lion. But, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting to think that Maine has enough wild places and enough uh, prey species that these beautiful cats would come back here. Next slide. They are magnificent hunters and uh, they're capable of taking just about anything they want other than a grizzly bear or a, uh, a, a brown bear, although they could pick a cub. Uh, they have marvelous reflexes, uh, jumping, running ability, et cetera. Next slide. I love this picture. You'll notice how big those feet are. They're very capable on the snow, a little bit like the lynx, and they can move so silently. I know two people that have been out turkey hunting in the West who were calling, making the sound of a, of a turkey, trying to call in a gobbler who heard a noise behind them turned and looked and here was a cougar sneaking in on them. That would pucker you up just a little bit, wouldn't it? <laughs> Next slide. They're great travelers. Like I mentioned, this uh, cat from Connecticut, uh, but there are other examples of it. When I lived in New York, we had a very similar thing happen about 20 miles south of me. And um, years later, they found a dead uh, cougar on the road. They're quite comfortable in the water as well. They, they, quite happy to swim if they need to, to escape danger or, or to find food somewhere. They're great in the air as well. I was in Idaho for about a week with a, uh, a friend who was a, a retired uh, game biologist for the state of Idaho. And uh, he showed me a cat in a tree. It took a lot of walking, but uh, we managed to find one. And I've never seen anything like it. This cat was about 40 feet up. And uh, as we got close, obviously it wasn't too happy with our presence. The cat launched itself out of the tree at that height, landed on the ground. Cats are pretty good at that. But then ran up this very steep snow covered slope at a pitch. There's no way I could have walked up it, let alone run. We were just in awe of the power and speed and the strength of that cat. Next slide. Beautiful little creatures. Those spots fade in the second year. 
And I think if we look at mom protecting those two, we would decide we'd want to leave them well alone and not get too close to them. They are an apex predator. As I said, they're, they're capable of taking anything, including this guy right here, a mature bull elk could be as big as a thousand pounds. And that cat is capable of jumping on its back, biting the back of the neck, uh, so they get a hold of the spinal cord and they will reach around with their paw and snap the neck. Imagine the power necessary to do that to an animal that outweighs you by seven, 800 pounds. It's really something. This biologist told me that in areas where they're primarily feeding on deer, they will kill one every four days. That's a lot of deer over the course of a year. This one is from uh, South America down in Patagonia. I, I, wanted to show that simply to illustrate that the puma, close cousin of the puma or the mountain lion, lives as far south as southern Chile and Argentina, and in that case, preying on the Juanaco. So we're nearing the end here. Maine uh, has a tremendous diversity of species. It's one of the great delights of my life uh, living here that we have not just those creatures on land, and the variety from here up into the mountains, uh, down east, et cetera, is really spectacular. But then we have all the creatures in the ocean around us, the streams, the lakes, the ponds, et cetera. Right. A lot of these creatures have suffered population declines and often the root cause is us and our development and the, the uh, slavish uh, devotion to building and killing everything in sight. Um, some uh, have suffered for other reasons, like the uh, white nose syndrome that's wiped out so many of the bats. Fortunately, they seem to be coming back slightly. I saw three last summer at my cabin, much to my delight, having not seen them in several years. Roseate tern, because of protections now, starting to make a little progress coming back. Next slide. Uh, Eastern oysters in the wild are, are coming back after the um, parasite that uh, wiped out 99% of them. Uh, the red-tailed hawk and a lot of the other raptors that used to be shot on site or poisoned by farmers who didn't like them around. The Migratory Bird Act has changed life for them. Nowadays, uh, in some areas, there are actually too many raptors because they knock down the uh, population of, of other creatures. Go ahead. Some like the uh, beautiful piping plovers or plovers, depending on your preference, are uh, newsworthy and photogenic as heck, but one big hurricane at the wrong time of year could wipe out the 2000 odd birds uh, that we have here. The population in the Midwest, in Michigan, uh, the Great Lakes area are, are not doing as well as ours. So they're, they're really on the edge. Um, Brook trout, uh, you know, we, we don't need to be introducing fish like the pike, the muskie, the largemouth bass into the beautiful ponds we have all over Maine. 95% of the remaining native wild uh, habitat for brook trout is in Maine. And it's a tremendous resource for our state. We have to protect these fish. The monarch, uh, you know that story, I'm sure, um, where the absence of uh, milkweed means that they don't lay eggs. And there's a national effort now to plant milkweed on their travel routes between places like Maine and Mexico where they go in the winter. So bottom line, without habitat, we will have no wildlife. And the efforts of groups like the Land Trust are absolutely primary in, in saving the creatures, the wild spaces that we all know and love my hat's off to you and uh, you know the work we do to train people to teach our children to, to write to publish and so on is so important to increase public awareness of and respect for the environment around us next slide. so i want to thank uh, photographers who were kind enough to loan me uh, some of their shots for this presentation uh sharp shin hawk thanks you as well <laughs> next uh, the books are available. They're actually free. The autograph is $20 a piece. <laughs> I don't know what good that'll do on your bookshelf, but uh, 
Uh, we, we've had a lot of fun with this. We're now, we're, we're actually waiting the third printing of book one for a book that originally we were just gonna give out to major donors. It's turned into a bit of a commercial project for the land trust. So we have bookstores all across Maine selling it. Uh, we have some in Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire as well. Uh, the next book is gonna be about wildlife across America. Had a lot of questions about species that don't necessarily live here. So we'll see how that one goes. So question and answer. I don't know how long we have, Julia, but uh, I'm happy to address any questions. Okay. Thank you very much.